as you listened to that presentation and marshalling of the evidence, you probably thought, what does the other side have to say? Are they just in utter silence, deafened you know, to the point where they can't speak about this? They have plenty to say. First, they go on the attack. The most common response to the fine-tuning of the universe is this response from atheists. It's the idea that if the universe needs complexity and God created the universe, then God needs way more complexity than the universe. So you haven't answered anything. Incidentally, who said that? Richard Dawkins. That's his answer to this. The fine-tuning of the, one of his answers. That if you believe in an improbable universe, it's even more improbable to believe in God, so that doesn't get you anywhere. All right, well, let's break this down. As we saw last week, God is a necessary being, is a necessary being by definition. I'm not saying that God must exist. I'm saying that if you believe in God, by definition, he is a necessary being. He has the property of a seity. Uh, meaning uh, from and say, meaning self. He's from self. He never began to exist. He didn't create himself. And so think about this for a second. It is improbable that the universe originated by chance, but it's even more improbable that God arrived by chance. Do you see the difficulty? It doesn't follow. It's, yes, the one needs an explanation. The other does not. God is not composed of a bunch of parts. We studied this last week. He's an immaterial, unembodied mind infinite in all of his attributes. That's just what we're saying but by the definition of God. Now, if you say, I don't believe in a God like that, that's fine. We're just saying that's the definition. Again, if you're looking for a unicorn and you say, well, why doesn't it have two horns? It's a unicorn. There's one horn to the unicorn. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about unicorns. We're not saying they must exist. That's just the definition. God is an immaterial being, which means there is no complexity in the essence of God himself. He's not a, a, a bunch of moving parts. There's not a hard drive. It's not a solid state disk. There's nothing of the sort. In and of himself, he is incredibly a simple being, not simplistic. I'm saying in his essence, he's simple. He's not divided or uh, split apart. So no, we wouldn't say that because one needs an explanation, the other would need an explanation as well. That doesn't follow. There's another principle, which is this. We don't need to explain our cause in order for it to be the best explanation. We don't need to explain our cause in order for it to be the best explanation. What do I mean by this? Let's say you come across a painting and you see that the painting is incredibly complex and it's specified. It's not just a random Jack the Dripper, remember? Uh, who's that artist? Um, uh, uh, Jackson Pollock, yeah. My old art teacher used to say, Jack the Dripper. Yeah, Jackson Pollock, you come across that. I know some people, if you're into art, you know what that means and what he was getting at. I don't get it. It just seems like a bunch of nonsense to me. But for most modern art, that's the way it is to me. I feel like my son could do a better job just by throwing paint at a canvas. That's my opinion. But let's say you come across something with complexity, but also specified. It's not just complex, like a bunch of random you know, blobs of paint, but it also conforms to the image of Abraham Lincoln. Well, that would be specified complexity. Now, if you came across a painting with not just complexity, but also specificity, you would rightly infer that an artist created that painting. Now, what if I said, <laughs> that canvas coming about by chance is very improbable. You're right. I mean, that a Paint store exploded and it hit the canvas and it just so happened to create Abraham. I'll admit that's improbable. But the idea of an artist, 37.2 trillion cells evolving over billions of years, that's far more improbable, way more improbable than the, just the can. If I'm going to go with a brute fact, I'm just going to go with the canvas and the painting, not some artist, some kind of a creator that created it. Who is this artist anyway? Is it a man or a woman? Who do they vote for last election? Huh? What's their favorite color? What do they watch on Netflix? We don't know that. I don't know. I can't explain everything about my explanation, but we don't need to do that. Let me put that another way. If we came across an artifact on Mars, I used to love this as a kid. You'd see these snapshots of Mars and there'd be a face. 
that somehow through the shadows, it looked like two eyes and a mouth. Let's say we travel to Mars as Elon Musk is trying to get us up there. We get there and there is a legitimate biosphere tuned in just right for humans. 70 degrees. Led Zeppelin is playing. The shelves are stocked with perfect food, your favorite food. And you infer there must have been an alien species that put this here for us to discover. That would be a good inference. We never made it, but somebody put this here. And then somebody says, well, yes, it is improbable that we have a biosphere up on Mars, but tell me who or what this alien race is of extraterrestrials. Well, I don't know. Uh, well, what, are they, what color are they? I don't know. How many eyes do they have? Not sure. T well, you can't explain what your explanation is, your cause is. Therefore, it can't be a good explanation. Look, if we needed to explain every explanation, that would lead to an infinite regress. Do you realize that? So 100 people come into the hospital with the same symptoms. And I say, I think this is viral or bacterial, right? I'm going to be house MD for a second. Viral or bacterial? Well, you haven't found the virus. No, I haven't found the virus. Have you found the bacterium? No, I haven't found the bacterium. Well, until you can tell me about the bacterium or the virus, I'm not going to accept your hypothesis. Well, then I find the virus. You say, yeah, but where'd the virus come from? Well, the virus, okay, mutated from this strain of this type of virus. Okay, yeah, but where did that come from? Okay, well, that third generation virus came from an earlier antecedent virus that led to that virus. That led, that, if you have to keep explaining back and back and back and back, that's an infinite regress. It's as annoying as the four-year-old saying, why? Right? There's good explanations, and there are brute facts, but this isn't one of them. We're trying to explain an effect that requires an explanation and just to say, well, tell us what that cause is and we can't explain it any further than that. That doesn't mean that's a bad explanation. As we've seen, the universe is contingent. It is not necessary. Necessary, like had to be there. These, these constants and values are not necessary. They, ha they happen to be in the Goldilocks effect, but they could have been otherwise. This isn't physical necessity right? So this is demanding an explanation. It's not a necessary thing that we're seeing. I remember uh, two of my friends were taking a class, a cool idea, theist, philosopher, atheist, philosopher, and they would have discussions and have it out. And they got to the fine-tuning issue, and the theist said, what do you do with the fine-tuning? And the atheist said, well, if I need a brute fact, it's going to be the universe, and if you need a brute fact, it's going to be God's stalemate. And they came back to me and shared that, and I said, didn't anyone say that the universe has constants, laws, and initial conditions aren't necessary? They could have been otherwise. Well, God is a necessary being. The universe is not. Geraint Lewis, this is the atheist friend of Luke Barnes in his book, A Fortunate Universe, says this, quote, it feels like we are ignoring the problem, not even trying to answer it. Blissful ignorance, but without the bliss. Well said. This is not explaining it at all, and it's not explaining away the cause at all to say that, well, God needs to be more complex. God needs an explanation. This is, this is a, an ignorance with regard to theology and the, the, really the philosophy of religion. It's no wonder that Chris Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, Sam Harris, all the new atheists, they just, this is what they use. Nobody believes in a designed God. Nobody believes in a created God. Those are idols. We don't believe in that. So for them to keep putting this out there even though they've been corrected for years, it seems to me that that is, uh, well, I'll leave it at that. All right, what about space aliens? Alan Guth and John Gribben. John Gribben is a science writer, very sharp. Alan Guth is a top-tier physicist. They believe that eventually humans will evolve to the point where we can create a universe. And this universe is the creation of an antecedent or previous form of conscious life. So the universe has finely tuned laws. Why? Because aliens created our entire universe. Do you see what this is implying? This admits that we need a designer. Don't you see that? By saying aliens did it, as Ridley Scott of an explanation as that is, this still admits what? That it needs to be designed. It couldn't have happened by chance. It couldn't have happened by physical necessity. So what do you need? You need a designer. Is this a good 
explanation for the designer. Like if we had multiple people saying that, um, oh, sorry, multiple suspects in a murder trial, and one suspect is uh, 35 years old, uh, very muscular, athletic, and he's being accused of beating a small guy to death. The other suspect is four year years old. Uh, it's between those two. <laughs> Uh, which would you pick? Would you pick the, the guy who could actually beat someone to death or the four-year-old who would be beaten to death? This seems to me that we have two competing hypotheses. That's fine. Which makes the most amount of sense? You say, well, it has to be a natural designer. Why? Well, it has to be natural. Why does it have to be natural? Think about it like this. You come on the scene of a crime and, and you're in the 1950s and you're in Mississippi. At the scene of the crime, there's a dead white woman. And you look at the blood splatter and you look at the, I don't know, they didn't have CSI back then, but it's an illustration, go with me on this, okay? You look at the fingerprints and the whatever, and you go around and you take everything together and how she was hit and killed and, and then you're like, okay, let's go find this guy who did this. And your commissioner, he pulls you aside and he says, uh, McTaggart, which is your name by the way, Detective McTaggart, all right, McTaggart, you say, yes sir. He says, let's go out and find this son of a gun. Let's get him. And you're like, oh, yes, yeah, sir. Can't wait to find this guy. And as you turn to walk away, 1950s in Mississippi, your commissioner says, hey, let's just make sure whoever you find is black. Well, the question would immediately be raised in your mind, what if he isn't black? What if it was a white guy who killed this young woman? Well, if you could be prejudiced, racially speaking, and that would make you finger the wrong guy for the crime, uh, that wouldn't be the evidence talking. That would be your personal prejudicial view talking. So all the evidence could point toward a white suspect and not the black suspect, but because of a, an a priori, pre-established, presupposition of racial prejudice, I wouldn't follow the evidence where it goes to the one, I would go to the other. Follow me? Your prejudice could affect the way you view the evidence. That's all this is. It's a metaphysical prejudice. It's saying the cause must be naturalistic. Why? Because it can't be supernatural. Why not? That's the same as saying it needs to be a black suspect rather than a white suspect. That's all that's saying. It's showing more about you than about the evidence itself. Why? would we only allow for natural designers and not supernatural beings? I'll, I'll take your question in a minute. The designer cannot come from within the universe. That's one of the biggest problems with this view. We're speaking about the constants and laws in the universe, based on matter and energy. To say that an alien created it implies that the alien is outside of space, time, matter, and energy. So that alien needs to be a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, and incredibly powerful and incredibly intelligent being which doesn't describe an alien, that describes God. That's the problem. It doesn't point in one direction, it points in the opposite direction. What about the multiverse? This was raised earlier. We're talking about the multiverse. Since about the 1970s, when fine-tuning was discovered, the multiverse became a very, uh, all of a sudden, in the physics community, this became a very popular theory that we are surrounded by a nearly infinite number or perhaps infinite number of universes. I wonder why the rise of the multiverse theory would be coinciding with the rise of the discovery of fine tuning. Here's why. Because if, let's say it's a 300 million to one shot that you're going to win the lottery, the Powerball, but you have 300 million tickets surely one of those tickets is going to win. Yes? So if it's incommensurable odds that we're going to get a life-permitting universe, but we've got an infinite number of universes, we're definitely going to be seeing a life-permitting universe. It's just going to have to happen. Now, there's two different views of this. The minority view is held by Max Tegmark, T-E-G Mark, M-A-R-K. He believes that these other universes are in different dimensions, it's really far out. It's very Doctor Strange uh, kind of multiverse theory. That's the popular version. Hardly any physicists hold to that. Max Tegmark would be an exception. Most believe that the universe 
our universe, came into being through the Big Bang, and there's some kind of a universe generator. It made our universe, and then it inflated off another universe, kaboom, another Big Bang, and then another one, kaboom, Big Bang, and these are all uh, spatially isolated from one another. We could never be in contact with universe B, or universe C, or universe D, or all the other billions, trillions, or infinite other universes out there. So they're spatially separated from our universe, and we're one universe among many. Hence, not a universe, one verse, but a multiverse. That's the theory. With me? There is zero evidence for this view. Zero. Proponents of the view, like Martin Rees of Oxford, or rather Cambridge, he is a multiverse supporter, and he says this is no more than a theory. This is in his book, Just Six Numbers, which the subject of the book is how to explain the fine-tuning. And he says, how do I explain it? The multiverse. How much evidence is there for that, Dr. Reese? Zero. It's just a theory. George Ellis, if you look up this article here, does the multiverse really exist? He is one of the top whew, five cosmologists living on planet Earth today. And in this article in Scientific American, he gives a scathing review of the evidence for the multiverse. I mean, it is embarrassing. By the time you're done reading it, pick up that article. It's free online. George Ellis, Does the Multiverse Really Exist? In it, he says, there's no way in principle we could find evidence. Well, maybe in the future we'll find it. No, not even in principle can we discover these other spatially isolated universes. As we studied before, if there's an actual infinite number of universes, that leads to absurdities. Bertrand Russell gave the example of this character called Tristram Shandy. Tristram Shandy. He was writing his autobiography, but each day that he wrote his autobiography, it took him two days to record what happened on that day. So on Tuesday, that 24-hour period, he wouldn't figure, finish writing about that day until the end of Wednesday. So he's always twice as much behind on the project of being able to catch up. But Russell points out, believing in actual infinities, he says, over an actual set, does he finish his autobiography? Yes. You say, how do you figure? It takes twice as long. Well, um, twice as long in an actual infinity versus regular as long in an actual infinity is still infinity. So you see the problem. That leads to an absurdity. What if you have uh, a universe in which you have 100 billion stars? Let's just say 100 billion stars. And each star has uh, 10 planets around it. And each planet has two moons. And you've got an infinite number of universes with 100 billion stars and 10 planets and two moons. What happens if you take away one of the moons from each of the stars or each of the planets? How many uh, moons do you have left? An infinite number of moons. What if you add a moon in an infinite set? How many do you have left? An infinite number, or how many more do you have? An infinite set. Let's say the um, uh, rotation of a moon going around Mercury versus going around Jupiter goes around 10 times as fast. I have no idea about this, by the way. I'm throwing it out as a thought experiment. The moon goes around 10 times as fast as Jupiter, but this has been happening for an infinite amount of time. Which has more revolutions, the moon on Mercury or the moon on Jupiter? They have an equal number. See. That's the problem. Uh, there's a universe in which we have the Lord of the Rings. I mean, I know this sounds cool, but it's just not true, right? So just keep it in the books, not in like reality. Uh, there's a universe in which we have uh, Richard Dawkins being the Pope. We have a universe in which Billy Graham wrote The God Delusion. We have a universe for everything. And if we're saying it's an actual infinite set, that leads to absurdities in reality. This eliminates probability theory. If you're going to use the multiverse to explain this improbability of 10 to the 37th and 10 to the 120th and 10 to the 10 to the 123rd, you have to use it to explain all improbabilities for the rest of your life. Anytime something seems fishy to you and the odds don't go in your favor and you think someone's actually been cheating, you can't say that that was improbable because there's an infinite number of universes in which that could have happened. More on that later. This doesn't pass Occam's razor. William of Occam, I believe in the um, 11th century, had his, his, his view. Not the simplest explanation is right. 
It's that we shouldn't multiply causes beyond necessity. We shouldn't multiply causes beyond necessity. If one person was stabbed to death, sorry, if someone was stabbed to death with 54 stab wounds, we wouldn't say that 54 people stabbed the person once. We would say one person stabbed the person 54 times. Now, could it be 54 people? Yes, it could. Occam's razor just says, if we don't know better, either way, we shouldn't multiply causes beyond necessity. It seems that to replace one God, you need to have an infinite number of universes. This is breaking, <laughs> this is breaking Occam's razor to the upteenth degree. It, we can no longer use Occam's razor if we believe in the multiverse. It, that is toast. We might as well just get rid of it and stop saying we believe in Occam's razor. It, all right, then there's the inverse gambler's fallacy. Inverse gambler's fallacy. How does this work? Here's the gambler's fallacy. You walk up to a friend and he says, hey, I, I've been flipping this quarter 10 times and each time it came up heads. He said, now, how much do you want to bet that it's going to come up tails this time? Let's see, 50% chance in the first flip, 50% times 50%, 25% chance for the second, 12.5%. Uh, 6.25%. You realize the odds of flipping a quarter 10 times and it coming up heads every time, that's very, very small. But we're not saying that he predicted that in advance. We're saying that he just so happened to flip a coin and it came up heads. Wow, flipped it again, came up heads, flipped it again. Now on the 11th time, he says, what do you think the odds are it's going to come up tails this time? Because we had 10 heads in a row. What do you think the odds are if I flip this quarter, it's going to be heads or tails? You know what the odds are? 50-50. That's the gambler's fallacy. It's looking and seeing somebody throw, you know, uh, two sixes at the craps table, saying, oh, they keep throwing it. And this time, the odds are they can't throw a, a one in 36 chance over and over and over and over. No, it's still a one in 36 chance to throw two sixes at the craps table. So that's the gambler's fallacy. The inverse gambler's fallacy works like this. Uh, Philip Goff, who's a philosopher, gives this thought experiment. What's the thought experiment? He says, let's say you wake up in a hospital room, you have amnesia, you're looking around the hospital room, and you see that there is a chimpanzee typing the complete works of Shakespeare on a laptop. A Macintosh, no less, okay? And he's typing the complete works of Shakespeare. He says, what would you assume? What would you assume? One, you could say, well, okay, I've got to be dreaming. I, I don't remember getting here. I, I don't know if I was in a car accident. I, I can't remember anything. Maybe I'm still asleep. I'm unconscious. Maybe I'm on the lotted. <laughs> maybe I'm having some kind of a trip here. Uh, maybe uh, this is a trained monkey. Maybe they did that. You know, this is some kind of a trick, a ruse. Maybe I'm on a magic for humans, you know, and they're just trying to trick me, and I'm watching this monkey type this out. Or maybe there's some kind of a trick with the laptop or something. Um, Maybe it's a robot. Maybe they created a robot. You would come up with any number of explanations, right? Would it make any sense to say, there's probably lots of monkeys around here mostly writing nonsense? Do you see the inverse fallacy? The fallacy is this. It's not enough to say, well, with enough chances and enough people and enough monkeys, they could write the complete works of Shakespeare. The question is, why is this monkey writing the complete works of Shakespeare? And that's Goff's point, is we're in the universe in which we find life permitting constants and values. We can't just look out at the improbabilities of all the others, if they exist. We have to explain why it occurred here in the same way that we would have to say, why is there a monkey typing the complete works of Shakespeare? It's the inverse, uh, I thought that was brilliant. Anyways, what about the weak anthropic principle? Let me define it first before we destroy it, okay? <laughs> Definition. This is also a uh, Richard Dawkins approach. It was also the view of Brandon Carter, who was one of the pioneers of fine-tuning. How do you explain it? Here's how. If the laws and constants and initial conditions in our universe weren't finely tuned to permit life, would you be surprised about it? No? You'd be dead? Yeah, well, I guess then we have to be viewing a life-permitting universe with finely-tuned 
constants and laws and initial conditions. Because if it wasn't here, then you'd be dead. And if you were dead, then you wouldn't be observing this phenomenon. Or if fine-tuning didn't occur, we'd be dead. So it must have happened or we wouldn't be here. Paul Davies, in one of his books, puts it this way. He says, how many of your distant, direct ancestors died childless? Oh, it's such an incredible improbability that I'm here, that I'm here. Well, if you weren't here, you wouldn't be surprised about it. So, so quit it, right? That's the argument, the weak anthropic principle. Now, there's another form called the strong anthropic principle, which says that human observers created the universe. That is wacky. Is one person, it's the SAP. One physicist called it the CRAP. <laughs> the uh, credulous, ridiculous anthropic principle, I think is what he called it. The weak anthropic principle says, if the miraculous didn't happen or whatever, then you wouldn't be here to be surprised about it. Therefore, it must have happened. Then there's just the anthropic principle, which says, we're viewing a universe that is allowing us to exist, and that's kind of a neutral term, but the weak and the strong are the ones that are in play here. Here's Martin Rees in his book, Just Six Numbers. He says, many scientists take this line, the weak anthropic principle. Well, we wouldn't be here to be surprised about it. He says, but it certainly leaves me unsatisfied. <laughs> yeah, he's right about that, and here's why. This, well, let, let me pause before we go any further. This is not a scientific explanation is it? What kind of explanation is this? Philosophical. It's, a phil it's an interpretation of the science, not science. So that's fair if they want to give a philosophical interpretation, but don't say that we're doing the science and you're doing theology. We're both trying to interpret the data. Here's the first problem with this view. It confuses a necessary condition with a causal explanation. So what does that mean? Is it necessary for me to be alive to be surprised at the fine-tuning? Oh, yeah. If I was dead, I wouldn't be looking at it. But is that a causal explanation of the fine-tuning? No. No, of course I need to be a human observer to observe it. But that doesn't explain it just because I'm here. So let me think about it like this. You come across a house that's been lit on fire. You suspect arson. You're not sure. Could have been a lightning bolt. Could have been an electrical fire. But I mean, this thing is really cooking. And somebody asks you, what was the cause of the fire? And you respond, oxygen. Oxygen. Now, was oxygen, is oxygen a necessary condition for that fire? Yes, it's a necessary condition. No oxygen, no fire. But a necessary condition is not a causal explanation. Something lit that on fire, and those are not the same. So while it's true that if I was dead, I wouldn't be looking at the fine-tuning, it is not true that that explains the fine-tuning at all, not at all, not even close to an explanation. John Leslie has still given the best illustration on this. This is back in 1982. He's a philosopher, and he says, imagine that you're standing up in some kind of a civil war, and, and they finally catch you, and you're a prisoner of war, and they say, tomorrow we're going to execute you, and we're going to have a hundred trained marksmen aiming their rifles right at your head and your heart. And so they stand you up in front of the wall, and they blindfold you, and they tie your hands behind your back, and you hear the commander of the enemy army scream out in a loud voice, ready men, aim, fire! And you just hear, just the cacophony of rifles, you know? And you're sitting there, and then all of a sudden, the commander comes up, takes your blindfold off, cuts your cord loose. You're not touched. Now, what, you look back at the wall, there's a perfect James Rochford silhouette of you on that wall, or of me on that wall. What? And the commander grabs you by the scruff of the neck, throws you back in your prison cell. What would you think about that? Well, you're, you're pacing all night. You're thinking to yourself, okay, all right. Uh, maybe... My comrades put blanks in the guns. Maybe that was it. That explained. No, no, there was, a, there was a silhouette of guns. No, wasn't it? Okay, maybe they all missed on purpose because they wanted to see me wet my pants, which I did, right? Okay, no, no, I can't explain it. Uh, that, 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 why would they do that? Uh, maybe, maybe it was that my comrades uh, bribed uh, these people. Maybe, maybe the marksmen were all drunk and they couldn't see straight when they went to shoot. And just then your cellmate speaks up and he says, hey, buddy, 
It's getting late. And if one of those marksmen shot you in the head, you wouldn't be here to be surprised about it. So stop worrying about it and go to sleep. Would you be able to sleep that night? Is it true that if I was dead, I wouldn't be surprised at the incredibly improbable? Yeah, it's true. I wouldn't be surprised. The fact that I'm here and living means that I need to explain what happened. Another way to put this is a little bit simpler. You're hanging out with your friend and you're playing poker for $100 a hand, which is really wise advice, by the way. You should do that a lot, gamble $100 a hand in poker. You should do that frequently. Anyways, you're playing for $100 a hand and your friend deals himself 10 royal flushes in a row. One royal flush is the odds of one in 650,000. One in 650,000. And he does it 10 times. Now, you get up and he's taking you for, if my math is correct, $1,000. And you grab him by the lapel. You reach back to slug him right in the nose. And your buddy, he says this to you. He says, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute. Hold on a second. Let's be reasonable here, man. If I didn't get those 10 royal flushes in a row, then you wouldn't be surprised about it. The only reason you want to punch me is because the improbable happened. But if the improbable didn't happen, you wouldn't be punching me right now. That's true. The improbable if the improbable didn't happen, I wouldn't be punching you right now. But the improbable did happen, and we need to explain it. So, in other words, if we use this approach right here to explain the improbability of fine-tuning, this doesn't just explain this improbability. It explains all probability theory away. You can never again say, I think they fixed the lottery. I think they fixed that game of the Celtics and the Warriors in the finals. I think that this happened. That I, I think that I was, you can never again say anything improbable has ever happened because you're holding to the weak anthropic principle. That if it didn't happen, then you wouldn't be surprised about it. Well, it seems like uh, the cost of that is way worse. All right, what about string theory? If anybody tells you they know what string theory is, I would be very, very suspicious, <laughs> including your teacher. But I'm going to give it my best shot. What is string theory? Under string theory, the fundamental forces of physics, or fundamental particles of physics, are not atoms and uh, protons and electrons and quarks, up and down quarks, to make up the different negative or positive or neutral parts of the atom. Instead, what makes up these electrons or protons and so forth are these vibrating filaments of energy referred to as strings, strings. So these vibrating strings can fold and uh, curve into different formations. This is called vacua, V-A-C-U-A, vacua. And these different foldings or vacua, the shape creates the laws of physics. And the size of these vacua, the shape of these different strings, gives you the values of physics. So remember we said the laws, the constants, and the initial conditions. One is the laws in the shape. The other is the constants in the size. String theorists have been holding on to this since around the 1970s, hoping that this could explain a theory of everything. Contrary to the movie about Stephen Hawking, we've not discovered the theory of everything. How is it that the four fundamental forces of physics the strong and weak nuclear force, electromagnetism, and gravity, how do they all work together? Like, on a macro scale, gravity works, and we can use Einstein's equations, and it works out perfectly. But once you get down to a subatomic scale, the quantum vacuum, that kind of a level with um, uh, uh, subatomic particles, Einstein's equations no longer work. So how do you have equations that work for gravity that don't work for the weak and the strong force at the quantum level or the subatomic level. They're saying everything is made of strings. And so this is the fundamental uh, essence, the fundamental uh, nature of reality. And because this is infused into all of reality, if we could solve this, and they get into all this six, seven, 11 different dimensions of space time, I don't, I really I have a hard time with the science. It's that difficult. But they say if we could solve this, we could unify all of those different forces together into a theory of everything. With me so far? No? I'm going to keep going. All right. Each universe 
in a universe generating mechanism. So it pumps out universe A and then there's an inflaton field, inflationary, and it pumps out another universe over here. It pumps out another universe over there and another universe over there. Each universe goes through a period of decay where it slowly goes through different possible universes. So um, when it says here 10 to the 500th possible universes in this cosmic landscape, that's referring to one universe, our universe. So as it's decaying, the uh, strings that make up everything are going through different sequences of what the laws, the shape of the vacua, or the size, the values of the physics could be. So it's kind of deteriorating right down the line of the, the landscape. I know this is hard to grasp, but just think of it as we're trying to find the combination of the lock, and we're just going to start with 1,000 and then put in 999, 998, 997, until you get down, and finally it's uh, 664 is the final, because you just slowly started to work through the different possible universes. Okay, here's the difficulty with this view, is they say this would account for fine-tuning. This shows, for one, what I've been saying this whole time, that physical necessity is false. Oh, gravity, it just had to be that way. No, it didn't. Otherwise, string theory wouldn't even be a theory. It's showing that these numbers could have been different by virtue of the fact that these can change over time. This 10 to the 500th hypothetical universes are not actual universes. You gotta combine this with a multiverse theory. So string theory and multiverse theory could work together, but they're, they're distinct. They're not the same as one another. If you combine them, then you'd have a universe producing mechanism that's pumping out universes and inflating and kind of like a bubbles out of a, a kid's bubble thing. And they keep bubbling off more and more and more. That's kind of the way it is in our universe, allegedly. And with this, 10 to the 500th power is the mathematical equation for how many universes there could be, theoretically, not in reality. I don't mean there's five, 10 to the 500 universes, but that there's a hypothesis that there could be on a mathematical formula. So if you got that much math and that many different combinations, they're saying, well, they're not real universes, but maybe as it decays and uh, loses energy, eventually it could lock into a life-permitting universe. So these aren't real universes. This is hypothetical and mathematical. The difficulty is this. Most, most of the math in the 10 to the 500th power possible hypothetical universes is inconsistent with itself. So they say, well, we could come up with 10 to the 500 mathematical uh, approaches to these universes that would give us fine tuning. The problem is most of those are inconsistent and wouldn't work. And there's no experimental evidence that there is such a thing as string. We've never seen a string. Allegedly, these are 10 to the negative 35 meters. So picture a meter about that big. And then uh, 10 to the 35 uh, breaking up into parts. That's how small a string is. Okay, we can't, we can't see this. No one's ever seen it. This is pure uh, theoretical physics where we're trying to come up with a model that works on the universe. And that's fine. We can come up with models. Just like we can come up with suspects at a, at a scene of a crime. The difficulty is this. Does the model fit reality? The math is inconsistent for most of the universes. The experimental evidence isn't there. We can't see it. And really what they're doing is just changing the constants to initial conditions. So if you don't hold the string theory, you're saying, how do we explain these constants? String theory says, well, those vacua, those formations, uh, we can change the constant, uh, constants and explain it how by changing them into initial conditions. Well, what have you done? Nothing. You've just switched it from one problem into another. Uh, changing the language, but not really changing the, the issues themselves. The, the nail in the coffin of string theory. String theory is in real, real bad shape. I know people, M theory, string theory, people say, yeah, what about string theory? It is, it is on the decline, en masse. This is a dying view, and here's why. Since 1998, the cosmological constant was the nail in the coffin of string theory. They can't explain it, and it's inconsistent with their view. Here is the senior editor of Scientific American. She writes this. She says, now some theorists suggest 
Most, if not all, of those universes are actually forbidden, at least if you want them to have stable, dark energy, cosmological constant. So out of the hypothesized universes, most are unstable if we have dark energy, the supposed force accelerating the expansion of the cosmos. Yeah, we've studied that. The vast majority of the solutions found so far are mathematically inconsistent, the papers contend. So putting them not in the landscape, the cosmic landscape of possible universes, but in the so-called swampland of universes that cannot actually exist. That's good writing. The cosmic landscape where it's all possible? No, no, no. Most of these are inconsistent in a swampland. So far, all astrophysical evidence supports the cosmological constant idea. Look at that. All astrophysical evidence. And if this is true, that means string theory is false. These are not these cannot combine together. If you believe in the, the cosmological constant, which all astronomical evidence supports, string theory is toast. And conversely, string theory lacks any experimental evidence supporting it, and even worse, any reasonable prospects for gathering such evidence. Here's Leonard Susskind. He is one of, he's credited, at least I read this, as being the inventor of string theory. I don't know if that's true, but I do know this. He's an incredible supporter of it. In an interview, is string theory in trouble, 2005, he says if we do not accept the cosmic landscape idea to explain fine-tuning, are we stuck with intelligent design, a designer? He goes on, you can look this up online. He says, I am pretty sure that physicists will go on searching for natural explanations of the world, and I would agree with him on that. If string theory goes away, yeah, they're going to keep looking for an explanation of the fine-tuning, but check this out. If that happens, though, if the cosmic landscape idea, string theory goes away, as things stand now, we will be in a very awkward position. Without any explanation of nature's fine tunings, we will be hard pressed to answer the intelligent design critics. Guys, that was in 2005. It's 2022. In the years since, string theory has taken a nosedive. So what follows from that? Is he gonna stick to his words? String theory goes away, then uh, are we stuck with intelligent design? No, we'll keep looking, but we're going to be in an awkward situation, and we're going to be hard-pressed to, to deal with these people, these you know, weird people that believe that the universe could have design. 